Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm Nishant. Uh, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Ethnic Studies. Uh, and I'm really, really excited that Dr. Jodi Kim is here to talk about her new book, Settler Garrison, uh, and uh, really excited for the conversation that will come out of it. Before we start, I just wanted to uh, quickly, before I introduce uh, Dr. Kim, I just wanted to share some thank yous and acknowledgements. So first, I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Yuchan Arapaho peoples, and this uh, as much as is, it's a performative gesture that I'm trying to, a fake performative gesture that I'm trying to make, it's also deeply intertwined with what Jodi's work is. And I just want to read one quote from her book, uh, which connects processes of settler colonialism to the US empire uh, to, uh, to show how, uh, how important it is to uh, have these frameworks together in terms of thinking about on past and ongoing settler colonial processes here and the U making of the US empire in the Trans-Pacific. So she says, uh, settler colonialism is at once military's, uh, military empire's proving ground, obscured condition of possi possibility, an integrated partner in violence. And I think this, this will come up as, as we go through the talk and we hear more from her about uh, how to make those connections uh, and why it's important to keep, uh, those, uh, keep those connections foregrounded in our analysis of empire. Um, second, uh, this event would, be not, uh, would not be possible without the generous support for Center for Asian Studies uh, uh, and, the, and all the work that Liza, Liza was right there at the door, uh, who's put in uh, in helping me organize this event and making sure uh, uh, all the logistics for Jody's visit here. Uh, and I also appreciate the center's uh, annual theme of Asia Empire Social Justice, Home and Abroad, which, uh, which made it a very fitting uh, theme to invite Jody, uh, uh, Jody for here. So I'm teaching, this is part of my uh, grad seminar that I'm offering in Ethnic Studies, US Empire, and it uh, uh, worked really well with the uh, Center for Asian Studies uh, uh, theme for the year. And so here's a list of different events that are upcoming in the next few weeks, and I'll just pass it around if you want to take a look. Uh, I really encourage some of the uh, some of the events, which are also it's also in the back. Uh, oh, there's more flyers in the back, so if you want to uh, look at that, um, uh, I also want to thank the departments of uh, Asian Languages and Civilization, English, Ethnic Studies, and Media Studies for co-sponsoring this talk uh, and helping us raise the funds to bring bring Jody here. And uh, I think. Those are my thank you. So I'm just really, really excited that Dr. Kim is here uh, uh, to talk about her book. Dr. Kim is a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California, Riverside. And soon I learned this last night that she'll be joining as a professor of English at uh, Dartmouth College in New Hampshire in fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, her research uh, and teaching interests are at the intersections of Asian American studies, critical ethnic and race studies, post-colonial theory, feminist epistemologies and critiques of the U.S. empire and militarism. Her first book, Ends of Empire, Asian American Critique of the Cold War, published by University of Minnesota Press in 2010, offers a critique of the American empire in Asia through an interdisciplinary lens of Asian American cultural productions and their critical intersections with Cold War geopolitics and logics. She argues in this book that the Asian American literary and cinematic texts shift, reframe, and critically extend dominant interpretations of the Cold War by staging the Cold War as a geopolitical, cultural, and epistemological project of gender <coughs> racial formation and imperialism undergirding U.S. global hegemony. Her second book, Settler, Settler Garrison, Depth, Depth Imperialism, Militarism, and Trans-Pacific Imaginaries, published by Duke University Press uh, last year in 2022, theorizes how the United States extends its sovereignty across the Asia and Pacific in the post-World War II era through a militarist settler imperialism that is leveraged on debt as, debt as a manif manifold economic and cultural relation undergraded by as asymmetries of power. Dr. Kim demonstrates that despite being the largest debtor, debtor, debtor nation in the world, the United States positions itself as an imperial predator that imposes a financial and affective indebtedness along with, uh, alongside a disciplinary payback uh, temporality, even as it evades repayments of its own debts. She reveals this process through an anal analysis of a wide array of trans-specific cultural productions, uh, how a wide range, uh, a wide array of trans-specific productions creates anti-militarist, anti-colonial imaginaries that diagnose U.S. militarist settler imperialism while envisioning alternates to it. So without further delays, please give me a warm, uh, please join me in giving a warm wel a welcome to Dr. Kim. Uh, <laughs> format would be Dr. Kim would talk for a bit, uh, and then we'll open up for question and answer round. So I'm really looking forward for our conversations after the talk. So 
Thank yeah. you all for being here, and I apologize mm -hmm. for the state of my voice. I was more or less okay when I got on the plane yesterday, but things have taken quite a turn, as you can hear. <laughs> and uh, I think I jinxed myself a few days ago. I was basically bragging to my neighbors that I never get colds. The last time I had a cold was around the year, what, circle 2000 in grad school. Over 20 years ago, I jinxed myself, so now I have this throat cold. So I should be good for another 20 years or so, yes? <laughs> um, so if you see me spraying this, it's an herbal thing, soother. I hope to get my money's worth because I had to go to Whole Foods to get this. <laughs> only, things that, only thing I've ever purchased at Whole Foods because, you know, it's a full paycheck. Uh, um, thank you for your indulgence. Can you all hear me? I know it sounds like I'm in pain when I speak, but I'm actually, it doesn't really hurt, so I'll just power through and project as loudly as I can. Thank you so much to Ishaan for organizing this. I'm so delighted and honored to be here. Um, thank you. I just uh, want to also echo the co-sponsors and all the hard work of um, Liza Williams making the arrangements for me to uh, be here. Um, and with that said, um, I will just dive right into it. So um, let me start by asking, out of curiosity, how many of you have seen uh, the film Parasite? Most, most of you, okay, great. I'm sure um, you'll have lots of great um, comments and insights to share with me then. So I ask that because uh, my talk is an analysis of the film Parasite, and it's uh, drawn um, from my recently published book, Settler Garrison, Dead Imperialism, Militarism, and Trans-Pacific Imaginaries. There it is. That is the actual cover of the book. And what you're seeing is an aerial shot of the U.S. naval base on Guam, which gives you a sense of the sheer amount of space taken up by the base, both in terms of land and water. So that is pertinent to my analysis as is the fact that military bases are much more enduring and permanent than we assume them to be. In other words, they are not necessarily uh, what we like to think of as temporary um, wartime structures. So I would like to share with you a portion of the introductory chapter of Settler Garrison, and as I said in particular, an analysis of the film Parasite a trans-Pacific cultural text that is familiar to many of us by now. I begin my book with this and have chosen to present it to you today precisely because the film compellingly amplifies my book's central set of arguments and concepts. So Bong Joon-ho's highly lauded parasite, if you'll recall, made Oscar history in 2020 by becoming the first non-English language film to win the top prize of Best Picture. The South Korean film also won Oscars for Best Original Screenplay, Best Director, and Best International Feature Film. Parasite success can be attributed in large part to the purported universality and resonance of its critique of capitalist class dynamics and wealth inequality uh, through a South Korean setting and cast Indeed, the film is applauded for the ways in which the local context of South Korea effectively serves the universal theme of class hierarchy. In a New York Times review, for example, Manola Dargis writes, quote, the story takes place in South Korea, but could easily unfold in Los Angeles or London. The director, Bong Joon-ho, creates specific spaces and faces that are in service to universal ideas about human dignity, class, life itself." End of quote. When asked the question, what makes Parasite and many of your films specific to Korean culture yet universal, Bong himself responded, quote, essentially we all live in the same country called capitalism. End of quote. But our soul, Los Angeles, and London truly so facilely interchangeable beyond general categorization as global megalopolises. What if we were to widen the aperture and see alongside or beyond Parasite's putatively universal upstairs-downstairs motif? 
in order to apprehend something less obvious and more complex as the narrative unfolds. What would come to light is that even as the film offers a universal story of class strife that could presumably take place in any global city, it simultaneously offers a specific story of US-led global racial capitalism's particular modalities in South Korea. In doing so, Parasite dramatizes the four interlocking concerns of my book, Settler Garrison. First, the film connects the South Korean modalities of racial capitalism to what I conceptualize as U.S. militarist settler imperialism. I know that's quite a mouthful. Um, and this I see as the conjunction of U.S. settler colonialism and military empire heavily concentrated in Asia and the Pacific in the post-World War II era. So I'm trying to think through settler colonialism and military empire together, which it's, it's hard to come up with a pithy term for that, hence military settler imperialism. Uh, the Cowboys and Indians thematic refrain in the film, which I'm sure many of you have noticed, rendered through red facing or what I call Indian cosplay, allegorizes the trans-Pacific reach and transits of US militarist settler imperialism. Introduced as Innocent Child's Play, the climactic and gruesomely bloody reenactment of a bad Indians versus good Indian encounter in the film underscores how class dynamics in South Korea are connected to the ongoing violence of US militarist settler imperialism. So second, in terms of my interlocking concerns, Parasite also makes visible that the US, especially its military, can exercise certain jurisdictional and sovereign powers in specific locales, or what I call spatial exceptions, across Asia and the Pacific that it has transformed into the settler garrison. The, spe uh, the specific spatial exceptions <coughs> exceptions I analyze are military bases in camps, POW camps, and the unincorporated territory of Guam. Let me just do a little spritz. These are juridically ambiguous spaces where the U.S. attempts to supersede local sovereignty and exercise a kind of metal political authority defining the contours of law and politics as such. Thus, although Seoul, Los Angeles, and um, thus, although Seoul, like Los Angeles and London, is a global mega city, a crucial difference is that it is the capital city of what is effectively a militarized U.S. neo-colony. So if Parasite for those of you who've seen the film, um, if you, you, know, you might have noticed, it's in part a ghost story. So if Parasite is in part a ghost story, the specter of US military settler imperialism is embedded in the very architectural design and verticality of the wealthy park home, which becomes apparent as a kind of garrison. Third interlocking concern, Parasite makes visible how this exceptional spatial dynamic of U.S. military settler imperialism is linked to an exceptional temporal logic. The temporal exception, as I will explain, is the U.S. exercise of what economist Michael Hudson calls debt imperialism. And here, Debt is not simply a straight economic relation, but a broader manifold cultural relation and form undergirded by asymmetries of power at multiple scales. 
These asymmetries of power significantly determine not only the debtor-creditor relation itself, but also the question of which debtors must conform to a strict payback schedule, what I call the homogenous time of repayment, while others get to evade it without the threat of discipline and carceral punishment. In other words, it's a huge double standard. The U.S. imposes, but does not itself conform to the homogenous time of repayment. It is an exercise of metapolitical authority. So debt imperialism is this counterintuitive process through which the U.S. is able to leverage its massive debt, one significantly driven by military spending, as a form of power and create a temporal exception for itself of perpetual non-repayment. So in other words, the U.S. is the greatest debtor nation in the world, and yet it gets to roll over its debts indefinitely into the future, even as it makes others at multiple scales pay up. And not only that, we think of indebtedness generally as a position of relative weakness. But in the case of the U.S., it's a form of relative strength. It's an imperial strength because of the bullying threat that the U.S. imposes, basically that because it plays such a pivotal central role in global capitalism, that if the U.S. defaults, that this will cause an apocalypse, um, and therefore, Everyone else must conform to the rules of the game that are rigged in the U.S.'s favor. Okay. So in Parasite, differential vulnerability to economic debt conditions the relationship between the haves and have-nots, revealing how the homogenous time of debt repayment is crushing for some, but not others. It is a kind of fatal double standard. Parasite reveals, moreover, how the homogenous time of repayment applies not only to financial debt, but also a figurative or affective one. The way in which debt as a cultural and temporal logic, conjoined with the economic one, is imposed on material spaces of the settler garrison, such as South Korea, is crucial to how U.S. military settler imperialism asserts and continually renovates itself. Yet, as Parasite also dramatizes, the assertions and ends of U.S. military settler imperialism are never fully guaranteed or completed. So that incompleteness is the fourth interlocking concern of settler garrison. How the trans-Pacific imaginaries of cultural forms such as parasite at once mediate, critically magnify, and gesture to alternative world makings and relations beyond the violence of U.S. military settler imperialism through an aesthetics of settler imperial failure. My sense of aesthetics draws less on Kant's philosophy of art, beauty, and judgment, and more on Sylvia Winter's theorization of cultural forms as what she calls deciphering practices that challenge normative power knowledge formations and the dominant terms of order. Indeed, throughout the chapters of Settler Garrison, I analyze an array of Asian American, Asian diasporic, indigenous Pacific Islander, and trans-Pacific cultural productions, namely literature, film, uh, poetry, and performance, precisely because they do the important work of making visible how U.S. attempts at military settler domination, settler imperial domination, must be continually asserted and are never fully guaranteed or successful. Here, I am less interested in how realist literary and cultural texts mimetically reflect or mirror the real, but rather more interested in how these texts lay bare the power of appearance conveyed through what is presented to us as the real, whether that is a debtor-creditor relation I analyze in my book, or the U.S. Cold War in Asia, which I critically reframed in my first book, End of Empire. Moreover, I constellate and critically juxtapose cultural works produced in the U.S., Asia, and the Pacific Islands as a crucial archive, rather than considering them in isolation, precisely because 
their trans-Pacific and global transits, generally what I call the relational analysis of the distinct yet linked. This lays bare crucial connections that would otherwise be obscured or at times willfully ignored, such as how the establishment and stubborn endurance of U.S. military bases on sites, such as Okinawa and Guam in particular, also involve the theft of indigenous land linked to yet distinct from settler colonial conquest of Native American land. So taking seriously the critically transnational, relational, robustly intersectional, decolonial, oceanic, and archipelagic methodological terms of Asian American critique in recent years, I bring those analytic contours to bear, not only on Asian American literary and cultural works produced in the US and the English language, but also on uh, a, a global South Korean produced film such as Parasite. So this might address the question that um, some of you all had, the graduate students, about Asian American studies and Pacific Islander studies. Are So far from a problematic conflation of the Asian and Asian American, as my uh, Dartmouth colleague, Ang Bang Lim, argues, the Asian slash American turns nationalist sentiments on their heads by gesturing to what he calls the, quote, transnational, diasporic, and decolonial cultural meshings at once generated by and thus necessary for critically apprehending the dominant terms of order, such as racial capitalism and migration. I thus conceptualize what I call trans-Pacific imaginaries, taking up alternative theorizing of the trans-Pacific as at once a vexed and differentiated yet linked geocolonial site, as well as a method of decolonial critique, traversing national boundaries, yet attentive to local specificities and hierarchies. So having gone through this broad overview, let us begin our analysis finally of Parasite with how the film's class critique simultaneously amplifies the ongoing history or story of U.S. settler, military settler imperialism in Asia and the Pacific. Those of you who've seen the film, this will refresh your memories. In the film, all four members of the impoverished King family land staff positions in the wealthy Park household through a series of calculated and ingenious deceptions. The stark class differences between the Kings and the Parks becomes more layered through the narrative twist of triangulating these two families with that of a third. Um, that of the previous housekeeper, Wing Guang, whom the Kim patriarch Chang Suk has displaced. The narrative twist or surprise is that Wing Guang's husband, Kun Se, has been secretly living in the underground bunker, the basement of the basement of the elegantly sleek park house for multiple years in order to evade debt collectors. The very existence of this bunker is itself also a secret to the Kims and even the Parks for much of the film. What is set up as an interclass dynamic between the Kims and the Parks also becomes a gruesome intra-class war between the Kims and their doppelgangers, Wung Guang and Kun Se. As the plot unfolds, this tale of how the precarious class is compelled to survive by any means necessary increasingly intersects with the tale of U.S. military settler imperialism. We can think along these lines by apprehending the emergence of a Native American thematic, or what I call Indian cosplay in the film. This allows us to link the frontier violence of U.S. settler colonialism to what that gets projected overseas to Asia and the Pacific in the making of a growing military empire and settler garrison in the post-World War II era. 
Viewers are introduced to a seemingly insignificant detail. When Kipu, the son of the Kim family, the poor family, goes to the house of the wealthy Parks to be interviewed as a possible English language tutor for their high school age daughter, Dahe. As soon as Kiwu enters the house, Moon Guang, the original housekeeper, notices arrows on the walls and floor, commenting as she quickly removes them that what was once a famous architect's creation is now a play pen. We soon learn that the arrows have been shot by the park's 10-year-old son, Ta Tong, while playing with his so-called Indian bow and arrow set. This Native American trope becomes more significant as the film progresses. Ta Tong has become uh, what his mom calls an Indian fanatic, just like his Cub Scout leader. And his mother has indulged this uh, fanaticism for all things Native American by ordering a, a plethora of stereotypical toys from the U.S., a bow and arrow set complete with headdresses or war bonnets as well as a teepee. Ta Tong's obsession with playing Indian seems to convey nothing more than a fetishism for American toys as part and parcel of the Nouveau Riche Park's fetishism of all things American. Yet, this fanaticism draws on the long-standing trope of imperialist nostalgia for a time before the closing of the U.S. frontier. This trope functions to recycle the myth of colonial innocence. Parasite at once <coughs> displays and shatters the myth of colonial innocence in a climactic scene. Ta Song's Indian cosplay is indulged yet further toward the end of the film at an impromptu birthday garden party at the house that is thrown for him. The plot of the birthday party Indian cosplay has been worked out in advance. So here I would like to play a short clip from the film explaining this plot and it is about a minute <laughs> 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 아예 yeah. 그 순간 정의의 인대한 다승이가 짜잔 등장해가지고 도깨반겨 이렇게 정도 보내주고 결국 다승이가 케이크 여신 자식을 굳혀 우와 박수 막 이런 거예요 <웃음> 유치하죠 예 네. 사모님이 원래 이벤트 스프라이즈 뭐 이런 거 좋아하시나 봐요 예 네, 그런 편이죠 예 네. 근데 이번 생에 더 힘만 있으면 더 해서 그렇답니다 예 네, 많이 쓰시네요 대표님도 啊，好，你们好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，张米卡，好，
naturalizes colonization, which is to say that the very granting of statehood renders natural or invisible the colonial conquest that makes territories available for statehood in the first place. In this sense, we might say that the granting of statehood is U.S. metapolitical authority's ultimate disappearing act, for it converts metapolitical authority into political authority by incorporating territory into the proper, so-called proper, federal jurisdiction of the U.S. nation state. Metapolitical authority and the juridically liminal or ambiguous spatial exceptions constituting U.S. military empire under settler garrison is also a kind of disappearing act, this time effected by a mechanism such as formally bilateral yet substantively unilateral status of forces agreements, or SOFAs, negotiated between the U.S. military and the countries that host U.S. bases. The Trans-Pacific Cultural Productions in my book, such as Parasite, defamiliarize and estrange this naturalization by linking the land seizures of U.S. settler colonialism to those of military empire. Those of you who have seen Parasite know that this pre-scripted Indian cosplay goes horrifically awry. So I'd like to share my second and final clip. It's uh, about two minutes long and just a bit of a warning here that it is quite a, a, a bloody and violent um, sequence. Let me see here. Just listen then. <laughs> Don't watch. <laughs> scene when Kitek sees Tommy pull his nose closed against what he considers to be the intolerable stench of working class bodies. Kitek, the Kim patriarch of, of the, the impoverished family, he basically snaps. He deviates from his pre-scripted Indian cosplay role by taking off his headdress and, as we saw, going for the Park family patriarch, Tomik, also taking off Tomik's headdress before killing him. I don't know if you've, any of you noticed that detail. 
Certainly, within the diegesis of the film, this signals that the game is definitely over. Yet, given director Bond's known reputation for storyboarding his films meticulously, this removal of the two headdresses is not insignificant. It might very well gesture to Gitex and by extension the film's refusal to cosplay or replicate the genocidal violence of settler colonialism in an uncritical manner and to be refused and to refuse to be complicit with South Korea's aggressive allegiance to US led global capitalism and its neo neocolonial status as part of US military empire. The removal of the headdresses also signals that frontier violence is no longer a metaphorical, but is a real contemporary relation. This appearance of the Native American children parasite doesn't simply remain at the level of innocent child's play learned in the Cub Scouts. Indeed, putatively innocent child's play is thwarted Indian cosplay, resulting in multiple gruesome deaths, reveals the distinct and connected and imprecated dynamics of U.S. militarism, settler colonialism, and imperialism as they make their violent transits across the Pacific. The Cub Scouts, itself a settler colonial institution through which young boys get interpolated to adopt a masculinist settler subjectivity. I'm allergic to masculinist subjectivity. That's why it wouldn't come out. <laughs> the Cub Scouts, itself a settler colonial institution, through which young boys get interpolated to adopt a masculinist settler subjectivity via activities such as playing cowboys and Indians, gets exported overseas to South Korea as a form of US cultural imperialism, along with the necessary of commodified accoutrement or toys and costumes. Moreover, this form of US cultural imperialism is not only replicating as play, but is also materially connected to the logics and tactics of settler colonialism on the soil of what has become the United States of America. These logics and tactics get projected overseas to pivotal parts of the US military empire, such as South Korea. In turn, military empire is itself also a laboratory for configurations of rule and domination that get applied in modified form within the territory that has become what we like to think of as the domestic US through settler colonial conquest and successive seizures of indigenous land. We thus see in Parasite the visible eruption of the structuring conditions of possibility of the dominant terms of order. This is to speak of the visible eruption of the violence that is absented, invisibilized, and shunted, both literally and figuratively, to the bunker and the semi-basement, as it were, yet it is omnipresent. Indeed, Parasite displays the cowboys and Indians thematic without the presence of cowboys. Some of you might have noticed. They're just the Indian, good versus bad Indian characters, no cowboys. The cast in the Indian cosplay, as I said, only consists of a good Indian and bad Indians. The absence of the cowboy character as a metonymic figure of settler masculinist violence suggests how that violence is a kind of structuring absence, or absent presence, if you will. At once, everywhere, yet nowhere, omnipresent, yet rendered invisible. Indeed, as I have argued, the naturalization of settler colonialism via incorporation of territories as states is U.S. meta political authorities' ultimate disappearing act. In this instance, meta political authority on the settler garrison is the ongoing violence of and the gruesome structuring violence that undergirds South Korea's economic miracle and sub imperial status 
within Asia as part and parcel of the dominion of U.S. military settler imperialism. To speak of South Korea's economic miracle is to speak of its transformation into a U.S. neo-colony in the distended shadow of the division of the Korean Peninsula after World War II. To speak of this division, in turn, is to speak of the violence that is shunted, as I have observed, to the bunker. This brings us to the second interlocking concern of settler garrison that Parasite dramatizes. The transformation of spaces in Asia and the Pacific into America's settler garrison, the spatial exceptions where U.S. military authority and sovereignty supersede local sovereignty. There is the elegantly sleek Kim House. So we can think along these lines by asking why the, the Park House, more appropriately a compound, even has a secret underground bunker, not just a basement, but also a secret basement beneath that basement. The very existence of the bunker in their own house is unbeknownst to the parks for much of the film, though the whole house itself is a bunker for the wealthy. We learn from Mu Guang, the housekeeper, that the house was built by a noted architect, where the architect and others of his generation building a house with an underground bunker was not uncommon, given the very real and ongoing Cold War threat of possible nuclear war between North and South Korea. When selling the house to the parks, a much younger generation for whom the threat of war is less real, the architect did not disclose the existence of the bunker out of embarrassment. Indeed, the Cold War bunker or fallout shelter is a globally ubiquitous architectural form that has been repurposed or long abandoned as one among an array of haunting Cold War ruins. As I demonstrate the Cold War shame of this bunker past, the shame of one's nation being divided by an external force that has then led to an existential standoff between the two divided halves, is connected to the shame or moral economy of indebtedness. The bunker is thus a kind of return of the repressed of the Korean War, of the US's imperial Cold War machinations in dividing the Korean Peninsula at the 38th parallel into a north and a south in the first place, and of the still formally unended Korean War that saw the cessation of hostilities, not through a peace treaty, but an armistice. Moreover, Parasite exquisitely and excruciatingly contrasts the multi-level park house set high in the hills of Seoul with that of the semi-basement Kim apartment in the lowland areas of Seoul, which are vulnerable to flooding and sewage work. Yet, this upstairs-downstairs class motif becomes complicated when we consider the specific contours of the park house and how the film thematizes the issue of space and territory more broadly. It would be an understatement to say that the park house or compound is gated for it is surrounded and secured not simply by a gate, but rather a high and thick concrete wall of dark gray. On the right side of this still image from the film, you can see how the wall completely separates the house itself from the street, affording total privacy and security. In this light, while the house includes a secret underground bunker, as I have mentioned, we could say that the house itself is a kind of bunker or garrison, heavily protected and secured by not only the big wall, but also multiple security cameras. The Kims thus infiltrate not only the park family, but also the park garrison. To repeat a refrain said a few times throughout the film by Ki Woo, the son of the Kim family, Quote, it is metaphorical. This house, as the metaphor or symbol of wealth, specifically nouveau riche tech wealth, is also a garrison as the metaphor or symbol of South Korea's heavily militarized status as a U.S. neo-colony. That is, South, is, South Korea is a site from which and onto which 
the U.S. projects its militarist settler imperial power. I'm getting to the end pretty soon. In this sense, the garrison is more specifically a settler garrison whose making and contours in Asia and the Pacific I elaborate throughout my book. In terms of South Korea, it is home to, after Germany and Japan, the third largest number of U.S. military bases on foreign soil. The park compound and parasite that symbolizes a pivotal note in America's settler garrison. It is a heterotopic space. What it means and symbolizes depends on one's positionality within the contours of U.S. military settler imperialism. For Kunse, it is at once a refuge, but also a kind of prison, given his indebted, sub, uh, indebted fugitivity. It is a site of the U.S. frontier narrative, but also one that goes horrifically awry, as we saw. The departure or improvisation, as it were, from the prescripted Indian cosplay is precipitated by the appearance of Kunse, a return of the repressed ghostly figure. Parasites enter and ensure class warfare produces macabre collateral damage. Yet as I have been demonstrating, the ultimately thwarted Indian cosplay through which that warfare plays out bespeaks U.S. military settler imperialism's imbrications and complicities with global racial capitalism. As such, parasite as an allegory of class is simultaneously an allegory of U.S. militarist settler imperialism. If Parasite's revelation of the existence of the bunker that Kunse occupies is a return of the repressed of the unended Korean War, his emergence from that bunker as the indebted fugitive makes gruesomely visible the exceptional temporality of debt regimes that structure and haunt U.S. military settler imperialism. The, the film grapples with this third interlocking concern of my book, Settler Garrison, by making plain that for those without resources and privilege, it is difficult, if not impossible, to evade the punitive consequences of defaulting on debt. Short of disappearing from society altogether, Kunse is compelled to repay his debts with full usurious interest. By seeking shelter in the Park House bunker, Kun says indebted subjectivity is in a way redoubled, for he feels total indebtedness to the Park Patriarch, who is at once his unwitting captor, commander, and host. In attempting to evade the homogenous time of debt repayment, the repayment of economic debt, Kun Se takes on an affective one, an affective such a figurative debt is one that could never fully be repaid. Yet, it must be performatively repaid over and over again. It is precisely their vulnerability and proximity to debt that compels the fateful decisions of Kunse and Mungguang and their doppelgangers, the Kims. Household or individual debt of their kind, in both its figurative and economic registers, is connected to and also mirrored at the scale of the nation itself. In terms of the figurative debt, the South Korean nation's structure of feeling vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. is one of gratitude or indebtedness for two successive putative liberations, first from Japanese colonial rule at the end of World War II, and then from the specter of totalitarian communist domination after World War II, um, domination as World War II led into what would be an escalating Cold War. South Korea pays back this figurative debt and demonstrates its gratitude to the U.S. in significant part by hosting a large number of U.S. military bases. In terms of the financial debt, the miracle of South Korea's ultra-rapid modernization and economic growth has generated a host of contradictions, notably a heavily indebted precariat class whom we see in Parasite. In addition to displaying the contradictions of what we might call the miracles crises, Parasite also displays a refusal to submit to the homogenous time of repayment on the part of vulnerable debtors such as consent. This brings us to the fourth and final interlocking concern of settler garrison, 
has a trans specific imaginary subculture work such as Parasite to explain aesthetics of settler imperial failure that gestures to alternative world makings and relations. Although Princess Flight from his creditors is circumscribed by a kind of carcerality in the bunker and inaugurates a figurative indebtedness to his unwitting host, Mr. Park, in the end, it is still a refusal to submit to payback time and to the violence of his creditors. Through amplifying such refusals and rendering it ultimately violently twisting the U.S. frontier narrative, Parasite displays an aesthetic of settler imperial failure. Indeed, the violence and fatalities that settler imperial power has produced and continues to produce are a mark or index of that very failure or incompleteness. Parasite's aesthetics of settler imperial failure is also suggested, among other things, by the ultimate ambiguity of the film's title, Amb an ambiguity that turns on its head the initial presumption of who the parasite might be. This is related to the side of hand tendency of, of the cultural or narrative valence of debt. Who owes what to whom? Are those who have been compelled to be debtors really, in fact, the creditors? Parasite asks, who is actually the parasite or debtor, and who is the host or creditor? In dramatizing exactly how easy it was for the Kims to infiltrate the Park House or Garrison in order to leech off the Park's wealth as paid members of the household staff, it would seem that the Kims are the parasite of the film's title. Yet, by ingeniously invading the Park House and the household through exploiting and exposing the weaknesses, insecurities, and failures of the parks, and by extension, U.S. military settler imperial domination, the presumably parasitical Kims represent the ungovernability and unpredictability of that domination. We are thus compelled to ask, who is leeching off whom? Who is the parasite and who is the host? Within the context of, the, of a voraciously predatory capitalism. Are the Kims leeching off the parks? Or is it that the parks are leeching off the invisible labor that the Kims provide? This labor, though absolutely essential to the smooth running of the park household, is at once invisible and disposable or interchangeable. For as we saw in the film, the labors themselves can be quite easily replaced. One might argue that the parasite and the host can, in certain instances, be interchangeable. Yet, on a broad macro level, the creation of value and accumulation of wealth are made possible in the first instance by exploitation and by the violent processes of what Marx calls so-called primitive accumulation, such as colonial plunder and racial chattel slavery. I will conclude my presentation here by rearticulating the broad states of my work in offering an interrogation of distinct yet linked forms of colonial domination, the conjunction of US settler colonialism and military empire in particular. My book Settler Garrison departs from a focus on one form that tends to elide completely or de-emphasize the other. The aesthetics of settler imperial failure contain contained in the trans-specific cultural works I analyze, allows us to think through the relationship between settler colonialism and military empire in this way. Sean, you already read this, so this will be a repeat. Settler colonialism is at once military empire's proving ground, obscure condition of possibility, and implicated partner in violence. Indeed, as Jody Bird asks, within the context of indigenous studies. Quote, given all these difficulties, how might we place the arrivals of peoples through choice and by force into historical relationship with indigenous peoples and theorize those arrivals in ways that are legible but still attuned to the conditions of settler colonialism, end of quote what I call the relational analysis of the distinct yet linked is a method generated by the, by the power of cultural productions 
in apprehending circuits of U.S. power, specifically concentrated in Asia and the Pacific, even as the aesthetics of settler imperial failure makes urgent the imagining and creation of decolonial and anti-militarist world-building alternatives. Thank you all. Please feel free to email me if you have additional questions, comments. I'll end there. Sorry, I was a little slower with my pace than usual because of my voice. I'm afraid we still have like almost 28 minutes for question and answer, so there's ample, ample time in the beginning of your discussion. So the floor is open. Anyone would like to start us off with thoughts, comments, questions? Cheryl. Uh, I, I can start. I don't have a big idea. Well, thank you so much for that um, rendering talk. Um, my questions are pretty um, facile, and please feel free to just pick one to answer. One is, um, I just wanted to hear more about your thoughts about the intra-class conflict between um, uh, Jinxia and Mingo and, and then the Chen family, and um, just uh, how, how that, what that tells us about your, um, uh, about U.S. Um, military settler colonialism and um, pulling Cuba out from the ages. Uh, and then also, I guess, um, a kind of obvious question is, to, what are your thoughts on splitting and what, like what's the trajectory from parasite to splitting? So maybe you could just pick whichever one. Uh, yes. Is no, it's probably not a coincidence that Squid Gate is also a South Korean production. So in my book, I explain uh, in terms of also how this relates to debt at the level of the nation and the so-called Asian um, IMF crisis. Um, part of how South Korea <coughs> tried to um, get out of that crisis was to explicitly, the state decided to explicitly invest in culture for export, not necessarily domestic consumption, but for export to other parts of Asia and hopefully globally. So that has worked as evidenced by, you all know, how you, the so-called Korean wave, or at least you must know BTS. <laughs> and you, most of you, if not all of you, know the film Parasite. So all of this was in part engineered by the South Korean government's attempt to resolve a IMF debt crisis through investment in cultural export in particular, the soft power of that. And in terms of the intra-class warfare between the two impoverished families, unfortunately that is such a familiar narrative. Um, and within South Korea, it's especially stark because South Korea is, st I mean, even though it is relatively powerful economically these days and culturally powerful, it is still a very, very small nation. And so competition there for jobs and resources is, is, is especially fierce. And so what we see in the film is even as the Kims in particular are very critical and disdainful of the Kims, of the Parks rather, um, the way that global racial capitalism works, specifically in South Korea and in other parts of the globe as well, is that um, ideologically and also in other ways, the focus is on the 99% um, duking it out over whatever is left. And it's not as simple as the old, you know, what some would say vulgar economistic Marxist notion of false consciousness and people because of false consciousness uh, uh, not recognizing the difference between um, a class in itself and a class for itself. 
Um, I, I do think it is uh, more complicated um, than that. But what is productive about the this intra-class warfare, you know, what is set up initially as an intra-class warfare between the haves and have-nots, it devolves into this intra-class warfare between the two four families, I think in many ways is more powerful than an upstairs-downstairs inter-class warfare in terms of some of the thematics that, that I analyze. I hope that answers your yeah, question. You. Oh, Squid Game. Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm interested in your four interlocking concerns. And I'm sorry if this question is a little vague, but I noticed that you said that there were failure, but yes. not so much about like resistance. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about this dynamic. Yeah, I think you can see this. Right. Um, uh, thank you. What is your name? My, I'm, I'm Haruki. Haruki, thank you for that great question. Um, the aesthetics of settler imperial failure is my way of saying resistance. But I tend not to use the word resistance because that can have the unintended effect of reproducing the binary of those who oppress and those who resist. Um, but <coughs> um, what I'm trying to gesture to is resistance not necessarily in terms of a direct confrontation with power, although of course that happens and that's urgent and necessary, but really um, pointing to settler imperial failure instead because that makes it more obvious that there's room to crowd out settler imperialism and the power of settler imperialism with other things, with alternative imaginings and worlds makings and relationalities with one another. So crowding out and, you know, because there is this failure, inherent failure. That's why there's all this violence produced. You know, it, it, settler imperialism has to constantly reproduce itself and that generates the violence. Yeah. It's like, you know, regeneration through violence, that, that thing. Yeah. Hi, I'm Evelyn. Hi, Evelyn. Hi. I don't really, really practically read a lot of parasites. <laughs> and uh, I just thought of a few things while you were speaking, uh, which is maybe because of Song Bang Ho's fragile space, <laughs> it really reminds me of, you know, um, I think it was like Time to Smoke or some song years earlier than that, in which um, there's like a scene of like a Western, and it's called The Good, the Bad, and the Weird. Have you seen that? I haven't seen that one. Well, anyway, it's like about like 2007 or nine, something around there. Like he plays like the weird one, <laughs> but uh, it's it's such an interesting story <coughs> that we heard of Western folk. Yes. In South Korean cinema, um, it it was there, you know, because of the Harlem films, but it also had this light in the 60s and 70s in the form of what was called the Manicurean Western. Oh, uh, interesting. Right, so, so yeah. It, but it's like a folding together of yeah. U.S. Western folk, you see this like broad territory of people on horses and, yeah. and cowboy figures, and then this historical posture in the po a Japanese colonial era of uh, basically Korean people being complicit in such a northern climate for the Japanese. Yeah. Right? And so there's this, it takes place in Los Angeles, so called Manchuria. Um, because of this history that was being shown in the 60s and 70s. So then the general question I have is, um, because you mentioned sort of time-specific um, connections, to what extent do you think about the sort of overlapping of different, you know, historical settler colonialisms in this area, especially with the Japanese empire? Um, and then second question, I don't know if that's good question. It's great. You're allowing my voice to rest. Yeah. <laughs> Um, when you talked about you know the, the so-called good India and the bad India, it actually reminds me that you know that actually was a very strong colonial script, right? Of course. The Rodney, mm -hmm. And 
with the Trump strategy, just keeping people divided and you know fighting each other, and then ultimately then being able to you know persuade everybody to under settle. And, and yeah, and so I wonder if that's sort of unconscious that they're playing into that narrative, and it's ultimately a very dangerous uh, or imperative. It is exactly the good Indian is basically the native bourgeoisie. What what now we call the native bourgeoisie, the collaborators. Mm -hmm. And without the collaborators, um, colonial governance and rule would be virtu virtually impossible, if not outright impossible. And thank you for er for alerting me to this ongoing history of the subgenre of the Asian Western, so to speak. I will have to investigate that more. Um, it, but my provisional comment about that is perhaps that is related to this ongoing history of US cultural imperialism and Asian audiences being quite familiar with the genre of US Westerns. Um, in one of my other chapters, um, I uh, analyze an Okinawan short story. It takes place in the 1950s. Um, and the protagonist in that story, who's a sex worker, goes on a date with an American GI. And she describes, like, ekphastically in the story, there's a description of a film that they see on this date and how. Nobuki, the, the protagonist, is interpreting that film mm -hmm. in a way, a, a, a film starring Gregory Peck, something along the lines of how the West was won and how it is that she has a very oppositional, unexpected reading of that film in which she identifies with the Native Americans, mm -hmm. not the settlers. Yeah. A lot more I could say, but there's no provisional answer just for those great questions. Squid Game. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, what are your thoughts on Squid Game? I I would just defer to you and Evan and the other, but I'm so trying to, to process it, especially in light of um, what you're saying. Is there anything that you like can point to? I, I, I mean, it's in terms of questions of audience mm -hmm. um, as well, and so, you know, global audiences and, and things, but yeah. What's interesting, if I remember correctly, there's an audience within the film watching the Squid Games, which rich Western dudes basically. And the ones we are shown, they're all white Western men, except for I think one Chinese man. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's very interesting that within the film they are the audience and presumably the sponsors of this deadly game. Yeah, yeah. The insertion of the one Chinese man. Hi, uh, thank you so very much for this talk. It's very insightful. Um, it was great work. Um, so this is a this is a point. I'm I'm building up this into a question as I'm speaking. Yes. Um, so I'm really taken with uh, your characterization, um, not of resistance, as you said, but rather of refusal, mm -hmm. right? And uh, your discussion of, of fugitivity, especially fugitivity to uh, the kind of internal refine of, of a threat of being a, its own form of carcerality which I, I still is, has me thinking about what kinds of, if this is the settler garrison, there's this lesson here, I hear you saying that we get that is about just kind of the, the nature of captivity, and I'm thinking about Milton and, and kind of the- Invisible man, the yeah, barter, the, the, yeah, right. yes. <laughs> so, so, so many things. and. Um, and kind of the black tradition thinking yes, about fugitive the operations yeah. in terms of captivity. And I'm, uh, I guess my question is more, uh, do you mind speaking a little bit more on how you think of the, like what are the fugitive operations that might aesthetically 
if not practically, but aesthetically, is speed. I don't know if it's speed is the right word, but it's speed needing to only take up the terms of the garrison itself. Yeah, it is quite, Gun says, evasion of the debt collectors. <coughs> yes, he evades them, but only by becoming it a fugitive, an indebted mm -hmm. fugitive, who swears allegiance to his captain, you know, his host, Mr. Park, Tommy Park, every single day. So there's a profound, um, there's a profound contradiction in that. But what I find useful about the fact that he is physically um, confined to cap a fugitive kind of captive space, that's for me that spatially literalizes and materializes the condition of what it means to be heavily indebted, which is a condition for most of us of un various degrees of unfreedom. And, but in it, his case, it's a little bit more complicated because he trades in one kind of unfreedom for another related kind of unfreedom. But I applaud his, his um, I applaud his effort because at the end of the day, the creditors still don't get their money. And so it's a refusal to pay back, which is related to the broader question of debt abolition. So obviously in terms of abolition, we, you know, we've been discussing it in terms of the prison regime, but increasingly there's a movement to abolish debt, which is different from forgiving debt because to forgive debt gets us back into the, the Christian morality of it all, how mm -hmm. if you can't pay back your loans, we're gonna forgive you, you're still the sinner. Mm -hmm. We're the wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're the wonderful uh, liberators to whom you should be grateful, right? So we're going to forgive your financial debt, but instead now you have to be figuratively or affectively indebted to us for wiping out the financial debt. So, and it's a tie to obviously the problematics of liberal philanthropy and charity, which is part and parcel of imperial domination as well. So debt forgiveness is very different from debt abolition. So to have debt abolition and to abolish the creditor debtor scheme altogether, because increasingly we're living in what Andrew Ross calls a creditocracy. Um, and so debt abolition in that sense would mean getting out of indebted carcerality. It would mean we will have reimagined re and brought into being a different social formation altogether, which to many people sounds impossible, um, but it's actually not impossible. We just have to agree to it. But the debt is something that a lot of people, they, it's, there's something about it that's really intractable. Mm -hmm. You borrow money, you have to pay it back. Because mm -hmm. again, it's so tied to Christian ethics and morality. Um, and then uh, more specifically, there's also, there's this, you know, indebted fugitivity vis-a-vis -vis the character of Kunze and Parasite, but also the pressing issue of carceral debt. Mm -hmm. People who are locked up, who come out of prison owing money that they didn't owe before going in because of all the fees involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, just some of my thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. Given the, the scene that you set us up, you know, um, all of the violence that yeah. the question comes out, and the kind of hubris to fail narrative of the U.S. as the largest debtor nation, mm -hmm. would part of that imaginary also perhaps be that we have to say, you know, nothing's too big to fail, right? Yeah. We're failing all the time, actually, these contradictions are violent. Yeah, 
Nothing is too big to fail. Settler colonialism is always failing. And these specific failures of most recently things like Silicon Valley Bank are like specific symptomatic failures of the broader failure of settler um, colonialism. So yet again, another double standard. Mm -hmm. All those people are gonna, this, you know, risky venture capitalists, um, startups, <coughs> they're gonna be made whole by the US government way beyond the 250,000 FDIC limit. And the rationale for those kinds of moves, it's a kind of metapolitical authority, right? Mm -hmm. The rationale for those kinds of moves, again, is always too big to fail. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's always failing. And we see that. Yeah. Thank you. Like, all of us are actually too big to fail, <laughs> not them. What is your name? Amber Pelter. Amber, thank you. Thank you. I have a question, actually. Uh, so, uh, throughout the book, like you, you tell us about the position of these military bases and garrisons, and how like forty percent of U.S. military bases are in the Trans-Pacific, right? And I think you pull out different ways how this is in response to China. Uh, and more recently. More recently, right? And so now that China is the largest predator. For, to the U.S., uh, I just wanted to think about think if you like, like the more all the recent conversations about what China is doing and how the will move. Yeah, will move, it's such uh, an important question. Yeah, also, its relation. Yeah. yeah, the rise of China and the fact that China is the U.S.'s greatest predator thus far has not radically destabilized U.S.-led global issue capitalism. And I punctuate the thus far. Yes. It remains to be seen what will happen, um, especially as the Chinese state and the Chinese Communist Party also has imbi imperial ambitions of its own mm -hmm. that it is practicing in, in Africa and elsewhere through the mechanism of debt. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I, I, it's in my book as well, This. China's leveraging of debt trap diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis weaker nations. It hasn't done that vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. yet because the U.S. is still so hegemonic and formidable. But I do wonder the extent to which or whether and when and if that will change and when will be the so-called inflection point I, I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. I feel like I understand so little of it in terms yeah. of thinking about financial capitalism. Uh, yeah. But like the recent news about like more bases in Philippines and Taiwan, right, and targeting China, and it feels like the U.S. is trying to preempt if China was supposed to take its role as a predator previously. Yeah. Right. Like and that aggression towards increasing aggression towards China and uh, yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. And that's why a lot of scholars say that the U.S. Cold War with China never actually ended. It's playing out in various ways now. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think you give us really important tools to think about, like the continuation of Cold War, right, uh, and how China is playing such a big role in that now. Thank you. I hope you were able to hear. I wish I could tell you. <laughs> well, I, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Federico. Federico. 
What do you think will happen? <laughs> do you think there will be a new post-Cold War Russia-China alliance? Because they're both seeing that Western powers are not in interceding in a, an aggressive way. Well, the people of Russia and Korea can watch this and they really want to go to China. Right. I know it's it's hard to prognosticate, but if I were taking a multiple choice exam, <laughs> the question is: Can the U.S. empire come to an end, like just like you know empires fall throughout history? And the choices are in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, 40, 50. I would say 50. What would you all say? <laughs> right. Yesterday, yeah. Actually, yeah, kind yes. of like building off of that, like something I was wondering while reading when you were talking about like that abolition yeah. and whatnot was the specifically like the brinkmanship that's been going on with like Congress and the debt ceiling as mm -hmm. and like I was just wondering like to what extent like even like that is really enabled by this whole like oh the you know U.S. is too big to fail oh clearly this will be and like it, is this irresponsibility that like we're seeing with that really a really an irresponsibility or is it really part and parcel of how the debt imperialism works. No, the whole, <coughs> periodically we have the big, like, alarm bells about the debt ceiling. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, it's, it's political football mm -hmm. in terms of partisan politics. Granted, I'm not an economist, mm -hmm. but obviously there is an economic dimension to my work. And I'm quite taken with have you all heard of modern monetary theory? Stephanie Kelton and others. Um, this idea that the focus is on the fact that the US has monetary sovereignty. Um, the whole global monetary chain is pegged to the dollar, no longer to gold. That's why the U.S. is able to exercise debt imperialism, because it has monetary sovereignty and because the dollar is a fiat sovereignty. And so the U.S. with one little computer keystroke can create many more dollars. Now the problem with that, though, is if doing so causes inflation to such an extent that it wreaks havoc on the economy. So what, it, what Stephanie Kelton and, and that school of economic theory, what they argue, modern monetary theory, is that our, our real concern should be about inf inflation, not debt, because the US has monetary sovereignty and the dollar is a fiat currency. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I do recommend reading this book. It's, it's uh, available through the library, but also you can also buy, buy this also for some reason. So you can access it.
Sokkal ez a kívott, amiben mondjuk az a medvita volt, vagy semmi más. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. It's been four hours. Yeah.